Hello everybody, and I recently rediscovered an Inspiron 530 hiding in my basement, so I decided to try out its worst supported CPU, the Celeron 420. Now it only has one core running at 1.6 GHz and only one thread, so it can't support hyperthreading. I wanted to make this video because Intel discontinued the Celeron lineup, and even though this is a very weak processor, people still seem to like it. We're going to try it out in a few different environments, and I've got the video split up into chapters, but for now, we've got to find out why this thing even exists. Now the first Celeron came out back in 1998 as part of the Celeron Covington family. These processors were targeted towards budget-orientated consumers and had valuable selling points like reduced performance and less features than their flagship counterparts. For some reason, this worked. Rinse and repeat for a few years, and now it's 2007. This year saw the release of the first actually competent dual-core processors. Netburst was finally gone, and the Core 2 Duo lineup ushered in a new era of computing performance. These Core 2 Duos were exceptional, and used Intel's brand new Core microarchitecture as part of the Conroe family. The Celeron in question uses a variant of this called Conroe L, which technically stands for low power, but I'd like to imagine it stands for loser. It wasn't meant to run much more than a simple operating system, and it also maintained itself as a budget-friendly option, costing only $40 when it was brand new. So what did $40 get you? Well, I bought a pack of two of these bad boys for only $10 on eBay, and they came with complimentary printed out Bible quotes which I ended up throwing out. Both of them were a bit dirty, and one of them looked like the concrete guy had a CPU in his pocket. Like how do you even do this? Did the guy put thermal paste in the socket or what? Now each of these were decked out with a single thread and a single core with a clock speed of 1.6 gigahertz all pulling 35 watts. It used the 65 nanometer process and also had 105 million transistors with 64 kilobytes of L1 cache, 512 kilobytes of L2 cache, and used the LGA775 socket. Also it turns out that the 775 and LGA775 stands for the 775 contact points of the CPU, and also LGA means land grid array. I never knew that. Now, I haven't been very fair to the poor Celeron so far. It does its best, and it seems like people actually like it. Well, liked it. The most recent Newegg review was from 2008, but it seemed to be well received. People bought it because of its low power draw, its low price, and its general versatility. But what's weird is there's not a single negative review. Everyone loved this little Celeron. It's also weird that Newegg still has these things in stock. Honestly, I kind of want to buy one just to unbox it, but $100 is a bit much. But it was time to put the Celeron to the test. The system we'll be using is a slightly destroyed Inspiron 530 with 8 gigs of DDR2 memory and an RTX 3060 using an external power supply. I'll admit pairing the Celeron with a 3060 is a wild decision, but I wanted to make sure that the CPU was the bottleneck. Also consider leaving a like, commenting, or subscribing so I can afford to buy more e-waste. Thanks. Now to drive my monitor, I actually used Silklin's USB-C to DisplayPort 1.4 cable. They were kind enough to sponsor this video, and I was actually already using this product before they contacted me. The HDMI on my laptop only goes up to 1440p 120Hz, but this cable allows you to run 4K up to 144Hz using USB-C. It's genuinely a good cable, and if you're in the market for a reasonably priced, durable, and capable video cable, I've got their Amazon store linked in the description. They have a wide array of products with a variety of connection types, and I can't recommend them enough. Enough. Currently, they have a few different combinations of video I.O., including DisplayPort, Mini DisplayPort, HDMI, and USB-C. They even have fiber optic video cables for all your high definition needs. You can even use it to hook up your phone to your monitor. I use my phone to record, so it's kind of a weird angle, but it connected immediately and works well with Samsung's DeX. Once again, I'd like to thank Silkland for sponsoring this video, and I've got their store linked in the description below if you'd like to check them out. Now, I tested the Celeron with a few different operating systems and a variety of tasks to see where the CPU truly shines, starting with a lightweight version of Windows 10 called Tiny10. And we were off to a great start when I tried to full screen Google Chrome, and it became non responsive Responsive, followed by Microsoft Edge, which crashed and burnt. At idle, we were at about 6% CPU and 18% memory, so the OS is well optimized, but browsers were simply too much for it. The first actual test I did was with Cinebench, achieving an astoundingly low score of 16 CB. This was much lower than everyone on hardware bot, but they seemed to be overclocking, and when running at 4 GHz, still only get a score of 80. Unfortunately, this motherboard doesn't support overclocking, so we're stuck with what we have. The first actual game I tested was Far Cry 1 in 1080p with the low settings. Now graphically, our 3060 was able to handle this with ease, and based on the RAM usage, the Celeron was definitely the limiting factor. It ended up getting an average frame rate of 40 FPS, but more importantly,
certainly crushed any hope I had for running newer games. So I tried out Valve's Half-Life. For this test, we actually surpassed the game's Pentium 3 hardware requirements and was reflected in the game's average frame rate of 91 FPS. We played this one with the low settings and a resolution of 1920 by 1440 and didn't encounter any stuttering or lag spikes. Now I only tested 4 games using Tiny10, with GTA 3 being the third installment. We ran this one in 1080p with the default settings and as per usual, the Celeron was pinned at 100%, yet it managed to deliver a playable experience with an average frame rate of 29 FPS. GTA 3 also cites a Pentium 3 as the minimum system requirements, which we did exceed, but it is harder to run than Half-Life and our operating system does bog us down. The last game paired with Tiny 10 was Battlefield 2. I never played this game so I had no idea what to expect and opted to run it in 1080p with the low settings. As per usual, the Celeron was absolutely chugging but still delivered a smooth frame rate of 44 FPS. Overall, I'm surprised that during these Tiny 10 benchmarks we didn't encounter any stuttering or lag spikes, cause even though these games are old, our operating system is not. Maybe the Celeron's more powerful than I thought. Powerful or not, I then ripped it out of the socket and threw in a Core 2 Quad Q6600 to install Windows 7. I'm sure the Celeron could do it eventually, but Windows 10 took ages and I did not want to go through that again. Dude, I was screwing it into the motherboard. I wasn't even screwing it into the screw socket. It finished up in about 10 minutes and I swapped out the Core 2 Quad for the Celeron and here we were with 2009's newest version of Windows. Immediately, there was a night and day difference. For example, now when you clicked something, it would actually happen. Chrome ran well enough, it wasn't perfect by any means, but it was usable and I was actually able to download the softwares locally rather than transferring them via USB. Some more complicated web pages like YouTube did take a while to load, but I prefer to think of that more as a commercial commercial break, without the commercials, cause it can't load those either. This is also the first time I've seen a CPU drivers correctly installed notification, which has to do with its microcode and firmware, but it isn't a driver in the traditional sense. Regardless, multitasking usability while setting up multiple softwares was actually surprisingly good. It didn't feel like I was running a 16 year old processor that was $40 when it was new. It felt more like a public school laptop, sort of just enough to get the job done. After restarting the system, at idle, the Celeron was at 0% using just under a gigabyte of memory. CPU usage did occasionally spike, but it was already running a lot better than Tiny10. Cinebench still took ages to complete, I took a shower and by the time I got out it was like halfway done, but it managed to double its score. Looking at these rankings really makes me want to overclock one, so let me know if you have any motherboard recommendations in the comments below. Now the 3060 wasn't playing nice so I swapped in at HD7850 and hopped into some Half-Life, and with a resolution of 1920 by 1440 with the low settings it got an average frame rate at 85 FPS. I used the same settings as before in the rest of the games and in GTA 3 got an average of 80, and in Far Cry 1 got 61. So as expected, overall performance was better. The Celeron was not made for Windows 10 in the slightest, but it can run Windows 7 pretty well. But it was meant for Windows XP, we're not going to talk about Vista. Now Windows XP should not be this hard to set up. It took the better half of a Saturday just to get into the operating system and I got more blue screens than I knew what to do with. And I was ready to feel the power of this Celeron, yet performance was honestly about the same. At idle, the CPU was at about 4% utilization, but the RAM was much less, at only 168 megabytes. It also got a Cinebench 11.5 score of 0.38, which seems to be a lot worse than other tests I found online. It also couldn't run any games. Sorry to disappoint, but every game I tried to run through an error. I tried repairing and reinstalling the OS with multiple ISOs, but it refused to work. I ended up putting some graphs together, and as expected, the Celeron excels where it was meant for. Older operating systems running lightweight tasks. So it's not useless, the Celeron 420 can still do something, it's not worth its weight in pennies, was horrible in any modern operating system, but it has its place, probably somewhere in a dump. It's cheap to buy and cheap to upgrade from, there's no real reason anyone should still be using it, and don't buy it. It's a waste of $5, but it was fun checking out. I just like the idea of a single core trying its hardest to run an entire operating system and just barely getting by. Also check out Silkland's Amazon page. Sponsors like them keep this channel and this poor Celeron running smoothly. Also check out jandike.com. My friend was like, hey, do you want a free website? And I'm like, sure, so if you want to support the channel, head on over there. Anyways, I hope you enjoyed the video. Consider leaving a like or subscribing because it genuinely helps me out. If you want to join the community, there's a link to the official Jane Knight Discord server in the description, alongside a few donation methods that directly support the channel. If you have any questions or related comments, then leave them below and I'll be sure to respond to them. That's about it. Have a great day. Bye.